And if you could share your screen. Great. Thank you so much, Natasha. I'm hoping everybody can hear me. If I can't, just put in the chat if you cannot. So I'm just going to share my screen really quickly here. So my name is Rachel Zula, and I am the Graduate Affairs Officer for the Faculty of Medicine. And I'm very thankful to be invited uh, to be the opening speaker and provide some opening remarks about the University of Toronto and then drilling down into graduate education. And I also would like to take this opportunity to thank all the faculty members here who have agreed to present their uh, either course-based or their professional master's program um, to all of our um, interested prospective students. So the University of Toronto is a very big place and um, over the years we've been sort of ranked with our peers. And For some reason we can't see your screen. Oh, okay. Thank you, Natasha. I'm going to try that again. Can you see this? No. Can you see it now? No. Just a black screen. Just a black screen. Hmm. Let's see. Let's try one more time. Share. Better or worse? Same. Same. I guess you could just uh, talk about it then. About sharing. Okay. So we're just, I'm just going to be a talking head, but I had wonderful slides, which I'm happy to send out uh, to Natasha. And if you, Natasha, if you have some internal way um, to share it with the, with these prospective students, did that work? No, is it still a black screen? A black screen. All right. I'm not sure what's happening. We did try this before we started today. So this is not, I hope this is not indicative of all the other presentations. Um, but essentially, I'll continue on. We consistently rank pretty high up there with our other universities, our US peers and international universities. And in these rankings, whether it's Times Higher Education or QS World Rankings, you're looking at comparison across probably 1,600 universities over with in over a hundred countries. So it's, um, we're very proud of where we stand right now with Times Higher Education. We rank internationally as 18. Um, with the QS World University rankings, we rank 26 in the world. And with the US News and World Report, we rank 17. And across Canada in those three rankings, we rank number one. So the University of Toronto is a very big place. Uh, as of last year, we had 95,000 students enrolled uh, in the University of Toronto, but in terms of graduate students, it's much smaller. The majority of graduate students are based at the St. George campus. Um, there's one program, Biocommunications, which I believe is online right now. Um, they're based out of UTM, so it's even a smaller group of students. Um, but at St. George campus, you're looking about 19,000 students. Um, in terms of domestic versus international, obviously we have more domestic students than we do have um, international students. I don't know what the ratio is across the university, but I can tell you in the Faculty of Medicine, uh, we have a, just under 3,000 students enrolled across all of our programs with about 300 students who are international students. Um, so I really apologize that I can't show you this table, but in terms of the programs that are going to be um, presented today, uh, course-based master's programs, um, about 66 people are currently registered professional master's students um, in the rehabilitation sector. So that's occupational therapy, physical therapy, speech language pathology, it's about 600, and all the remaining professional master's programs, so translational research, our newest one, laboratory medicine, medical genomics, uh, and medical physiology, uh, just under 180. So there's a survey that goes out every three years called the Canadian Graduate and Professional Student Survey. And the last time it was administered across 50 universities in 
Canada was in spring 2019. And I'm pleased to report that among our professional master students, over 88% of them rated their relationship with their faculty as being good to excellent. 94% were either satisfied or higher with the overall quality of graduate level teaching by our faculty. 98% found the course load to be reasonable or better. And 91% would recommend U of T for someone considering their program. Um, I'm going to go on into how to apply, but everybody will have their own set of requirements. But our recommendation to you is to explore the program as early as possible. So go visit the, the departmental websites. They'll also list their, um, what's it called, their deadlines. Some, maybe one or two programs start in May, but the majority of them start in September. And once you're ready to, to apply, I'll put a link in the chat, um, which is a link to the application website. And just know that if you're applying to either the winter, so a January start, or a May start next year of 2022, it's a, it's a separate link. So it has its own link. And if you're applying for any programs that are starting in the fall 2022, that's a separate link. And the reason why that's happening is we're, the university is transitioning into a new application system. So just make sure you're using the right link when you apply. The application fee is $125 per application. And um, I'm not sure if our rep Rory from School of Graduate Studies will go into this, but I also want to note there are two upcoming sessions that are hosted by the School of Graduate Studies, which that's the sort of the main body that oversees all graduate studies at the University of Toronto. Um, they're offering a session on how to apply to graduate studies on November the 17th. 2021 at from 5 30 to 7 30 and i'll put that link in the chat as well um, if you wanted something that was a bit more specific to life sciences uh, there's another session on november the 11th applying to graduate studies and life sciences from 5 30 to 7 30. so that's it for me um, on behalf of our vice dean Justin Nodwell, and the rest of us at the Faculty of Medicine, thank you very much for attending the session, and we look forward to reading your application. I'm happy to take any questions. Um, we'll wait until after. Well, you have to go, right? Okay, thank I you so much. I do have to go, but if there's any, I can stay on for five minutes and I can just look at the chat. Um, sure. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Uh, so next up is Rory McEwen um, from the School of Graduate Studies. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Rory McEwen. I work in admissions at the School of Graduate Studies. And my job today is to echo some things that Rachel said and undermine every speaker that comes after. Um, the School of Graduate Studies is sort of the umbrella organization that oversees graduate study across campus, across all divisions, so life sciences, physical sciences, social sciences. Um, and I was told earlier that I was a little quiet. Can people hear me properly? So someone put in the chat that they want louder or quieter. <clears throat> it's about a bit of a raspy throat today. Um, I'm going to try sharing my screen. Let us see if this works. And I am apparently a little quiet, so I will try. It works. <laughs> it worked. Fantastic. All right. Uh, so. There, I'm going to go through a, a really quick overview of you know, deciding whether graduate study is right for you, uh, looking at the different kinds of degrees. And today we're focusing very specifically on course based and professional programs in the life sciences. As I said, I'm going to give some tips on finding the right program, um, which may undermine the speakers that come after me. Sorry about that. I'll talk a little bit about the application process and I'll talk a little bit about funding. Um, but I have some takeaway points that I want you to go away with today, and that is that graduate studies are very, very decentralized. So each graduate unit is making their own admissions decisions, will have their own application requirements, will have their own deadlines. So just because lab medicine and pathobiology has one set of requirements, molecular genetics is going to look very different. So always remember that different units have different processes. I can also tell you that if you're looking for factual information, what you're looking for is online, even if you haven't found it yet. 
So brush up your research skills and make sure you're not pestering admissions people. I don't mean me, I'm talking about people who actually make decisions on your application, uh, looking for information that's readily available on your website. And as Rachel is saying, you need time. And everything is going to take more time than you think it is. So bear that in mind as you go forward. Broadly, I want to talk a little bit about the difference between um, graduate and undergraduate study, even in professional and course-based programs. Uh, graduate study is much more focused on research, production of knowledge as opposed to reception of knowledge. The standard mode of instruction in graduate school is the seminar as opposed to the lecture. So students are heavily involved in delivering the teaching to their classmates. Um, and in many respects, you're a junior colleague of your faculty members rather than just you know, your student. Um, so deciding whether or not graduate study is for you, here's where I undermine all the speakers that come after me. The only person who can make that decision is you. You've made the right choice coming here today to get more information about programs, but in the end, you're going to be deciding what your goals are. Uh, what are you prepared to commit to? What resources do you have in place that you want to, uh, that you want to make use of? And where do you see yourself in five or 10 years of time? And the best way to find out what you need to get to that place in five or 10 years time is to talk with people who are already there. So find friends of friends, family members of friends, friends of family members uh, who are doing something that you're interested in doing and talk with them about how they got there. There are some exceptions to this. Uh, a lot of the programs that you're gonna be hearing about today have been launched very, very recently and are very, very heavily specialized on some particular tracks of career in the life sciences. So you're not going to find people who've gone through, you know, the pathologist assistant program and are there doing the work because uh, it's a brand new program and very carefully designed for a particular career track. Um, so most of our professional programs at the master's level take one to three years to complete in life sciences, not for three years, thankfully. They're usually course based, but very often we'll have an internship or a practicum. And they are there to prepare you for a certain profession or to hold certain designations. In terms of finding the right program, sessions like today are actually super helpful and useful. You could start on the School of Graduate Studies website, but you, all you'll see on our website is a list of 300 degree programs that you can scroll through. And we always want you to link back to the unit that's offering the program because each unit is going to have their own processes. You'll want to take a close look at the structure of the program that you're getting what is exactly involved. You're going to want to ask yourself, and I'll talk about this in just a minute, about funding, but I also want to draw your attention to what are called collaborative specializations. Collaborative specializations are not degree programs, but they are a way of breaking down the barriers between, uh, special, uh, between uh, disciplines at the University of Toronto. So just as an example, uh, people are very surprised to know that you cannot get a Master of Science in Neuroscience at the University of Toronto, because we have a lot of neuroscience working away, but they're working in departments like the Institute of Medical Science, the Department of Psychology, the Department of Physiology. So what a collaborative specialization does is it takes students from a whole bunch of different degree programs, puts them together in a seminar, and it, an introductory seminar to the subject of the specialization, and then encourages them to take electives that match up with the specialization. So you could be a student doing an MA in psychology, and one of your classes will be the introductory seminar in neuroscience, and you can hear people from kinesiology, physiology, medical science. And then when you graduate, you have not only your degree, your, your Master of Arts in Psychology, but you have a certification in neuroscience from the collaborative specialization. Uh, as Rachel mentioned, because we have such a wide range of programs, we're holding five information sessions for, uh, for prospective students. They're all via Zoom, they're all in November, and I dropped the link into the chat already. So by all means, come and get more information. We're still confirming which programs are gonna participate on each day, but we're adding more and more to the list as, as the years on. You also want to talk a little bit about funding your education. And this is where I undermine the speakers that come after me. Um, there's a lot more opportunities for funding in research programs than in professional. So you really do need to have a plan for how you're going to pay for your program. Some programs will have Ontario graduate scholarships for their uh, professional programs, whereas others will prefer to direct that funding to their research students. A lot of students in our professional programs take loans, and a lot of our students from professional programs actually take some time off before they come back 
to do a professional master's program. There are advantages to this. You can take out some debt, you can earn some money, you can decompress after the professor undergrad. But I want to remind you that if you're doing that, you need to nail down your references for your graduate applications in your fourth year, not two years after when you've taken time. What do you need to get into a graduate program? This is going to vary from program to program, so I have color-coded this slide. Anything in red depends on the program. Anything in blue depends on the school of graduate studies. So to get into a master's program, you need an appropriate bachelor's degree from a recognized university. Congratulations, your U of T, recognized university, done and dusted. Uh, University-wide, you need an average of E in your final year's courses. But a lot of programs in the life sciences have additional requirements. They may look at the last two years and they may require a B. So check the admission requirements that are specific to the program that you're interested in. Um, the application procedure is online. All programs that you're seeing today are working through the uh, School of Graduate Studies application site. As Rachel mentioned, we have two, we have one for programs that begin in 2001 or in winter 2002. Wait, all of 2001 programs started. Sorry. Uh, so for January or May starts, so there are very few of those, but they are still be on the old application system. I'll drop the link into the chat. And anything September 2022 or later is on the new application system. And I will also drop that link into the chat. You'll be asked to submit transcripts. You'll be asked to submit email addresses for two or more referees who will write reference letters for you. All programs ask for a statement of intent of some kind. And there may be many other requirements, such as a CV, GRE scores. Check unit by unit because it's going to vary significantly from program to program. And bear in mind that you use time. Writing a good statement takes time. Getting your referees lined up and giving them time to write you strong reference letters takes time. A lot more time than most students think. So, tips give yourself plenty of time. Remember that you may be applying for scholarships that uh, come due before the program deadline. Uh, and when dealing with your referees, you want to choose referees that are as senior as possible, who know your work as closely as possible, and for whom you did as good work as possible. You may not be able to get really strong satisfaction on all three points in any given referee, so balance out between your referees when you're choosing them. And I've thrown a lot of information at you. I've been talking very quickly. Um, so if you have questions, put them in at the Q&A. And at the end of this, uh, I will be available for questions and answers. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rory. Um, we're going to skip to uh, Dr. Erin Stiles from uh, Medical Genomics as she has an emergency to attend to. So um, if you can share your screen, Erin. Thank you very much. And thanks, whoever I'm cutting off here, for letting me jump in the queue. All right. How's my screen? It works. See it. Beautiful. All right. So Natasha, thank you so much for the introduction. I'm Erin. I'm the director of uh, U of T's professional program in medical genomics here in the Temerty Faculty of Medicine. Uh, and I'm really excited to get to talk to you guys today about it. Oh, there we go. So the field of medical genomics represents this ability to understand and interpret and really harness the information that's contained within our DNA. So we can use that information to help inform decisions about clinical care. And so both your undergraduate learning and the news have probably already told you that technical and clinical advancements in this field are just absolutely exploding right now. We know a lot about the human genome now. We know a lot about how genetic information impacts our health. We know more about these things than we ever have before. But because of how fast this field is changing, we also recognize that there's this emerging need for professionals who can generate and integrate and interpret that genetic and genomic data. Basically, we need people who have been specifically trained to keep up with that really fast paced nature of the advancements in this field. And so that's really what the MedGen program here at U of T is situated to provide to you as graduate students. We place our graduates at the bleeding edge of genomic medicine. And as a program, we're really oriented towards this new era of research and clinical science in which genetic and genomic data are very routinely being analyzed across an enormous range of patient groups and different medical indications. 
The program itself consists of a core set of courses across a two year duration. And generally speaking, students only take two classes at a time, as well as this one sort of longitudinal course that I'm showing at the bottom, Future Directions in Medical Genomics. Uh, and so one of the most exciting parts of the program is that it culminates in this really immersive capstone practicum. So Rory mentioned that a lot of our programs do capstones. Ours is one of them. Uh, we have a ton of really exciting pre-existing relationships with numerous groups around the GTA and across Ontario and around Canada and even around the world now. And these groups supervise our practicum students. And although the projects themselves are really varied and they change almost every year, they tend to fall into these four major categories, including working in clinical diagnostics, so working in a genetics testing lab, working with patient data, uh, doing that same kind of work in a clinical research group, working with biotech or different sort of genetics genomic startup groups, um, working in policy in genetics government agencies, and then we also have this opportunity for students who want something really specific in a partner group that we don't have yet uh, to work towards a self-directed or a really niche practicum. So what do our grads do and how do they meet those needs that we've identified in our healthcare system? This is obviously a pretty important question to you guys if you're considering a professional program. We know already that our grads are ideally suited to work in clinical diagnostics facilities or in research labs really implementing the tools of genomic medicine and filling this major and growing need in the realm of genome analysis and variant analysis and annotation. So these are people who are working in diagnostics labs, working with patient data, next-gen sequencing data, all day, every day, playing science detective. We also know that our grads are attractive to publicly funded enterprises and private companies that are generating and interpreting genomic data. And that could either be for a direct-to-consumer company like 23andMe or for a clinic. We know that our grads are suited to a variety of science communications, project management, consulting, and health policy roles. Some of the students that we accept are already clinicians or are already well on their way to being clinicians. And so when those students graduate, they either go on to then complete their medical training or return to their existing practice in some kind of new capacity. Some of our grads, of course, go on to pursue further education in a number of relevant fields, including PhD level studies, medical school, genetic counseling, uh, and then because this field is changing so much and so fast, in addition to all these currently available positions, we also recognize that we are training students for brand new types of jobs that don't even exist yet. So jobs that are just being developed that are gonna be really in need two years down the pipeline. MedGen program is the first of its kind in Canada. And so one of the things that makes us pretty special is that we're a dual stream program. So we accept students like you who are probably coming out of a BSc, uh, into a laboratory stream, and we also uh, take in clinical students who are, you know, already doctors or registered nurse practitioners or pharmacists. And so in a very general sense, to get into the clinical stream, applicants should have or be well on their way to obtaining one of these sort of recognized clinical accreditations. And to get into the lab stream, applicants must have completed a four-year BSc in a relevant discipline. So I put a few up here on the slide that we know are a really great fit for us but this is absolutely not an exhaustive list and there's quite a bit of flexibility here. So if you have a question about whether or not you're a good fit for the MedGen program, please don't hesitate to reach out and ask that question. And really importantly, these two student streams move through our program as a single cohort. So they do most of the same things, they take most of the same classes, and that really allows for our students to engage in these really interesting experience-based discussions in their classes. So hopefully I've piqued your interest a little bit I'm gonna stop here in the interest of time by saying that we are now accepting applications for a September 2022 start date. Uh, if you wanna be part of something really fun that's gonna set you up for professional success in genomic medicine, I would encourage you to apply. If you have questions about the program, as Natasha mentioned, unfortunately, I have to jump off, but I really encourage you to email me at erin.styles at utoronto.ca with your questions, or you can email our admin account at medicalgenomics at utoronto.ca. Follow us on social media, U of T Medical Genomics on Instagram and U of T MedGen on Twitter. Um, and everything that you would ever want to know about the logistics of how to apply to our program or what people think of our program or you know, what's going on with the students, uh, you can check out our program website at www.moleculargenetics.utron.ca slash medical genomics or check out our student blog, which is uh, all run by current and past students from the MedGen program at www.uoftmedicalgenomics.blog.home. So I'm gonna stop there. I'll stay on for the next like five or so minutes and answer any pressing questions that you guys have right now in the chat. And outside of that, please do reach out to me.
via email if you have any more questions. Great. Thank you so much, Erin. Um, so next is uh, Dr. Jody Jenkinson from Biomedical Communications. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm really happy to be here to tell you about our program. Um, I'll share my screen. You can let me know if you can see that okay. Yeah? Yep. All right. So uh, I'm here representing Biomedical Communications. And of course, the first question I'm always asked is, what is it you do? What is Biomedical Communications? So Biomedical Communications is a two-year Master's of Science program offered through the Institute of Medical Science at University of Toronto. We have a focus on visual communication of science and medicine, and we're the only program of its kind in the country and one of four in North America. So students in our program undertake uh, stories that range from visual narratives that describe scientific processes to um, information and data visualization to uh, interactive media and looking at new ways of, of conveying structure function relationships using, in this case, a natural user interface. So who are the students who apply to our program? Well, essentially, they're individuals who are really fascinated by science and have a very strong foundation in science, but who are also visual thinkers and who have an interdisciplinary background. So they may be an undergrad science student who's always been interested in art and kept a sketchbook. That, that's typically the sort of student we see. Um, life at BMC is, is always exciting. We have the most interesting group of students, quite, quite honestly. We're based primarily out at UTM in a really fantastic facility there uh, where we're able to offer uh, students a, a really good taste of what the kind of technology that they would um, be using in the program and in industry as well. Uh, our program consists of 17 half courses and we too have a capstone or MRP project. So our curriculum includes science uh, courses in anatomy, neuroanatomy, molecular biology, pathology, as well as courses in illustration, courses in design, and courses that have a strong focus on technology. So here are just some examples of illustrations that one student um, who graduated a few years ago completed well in the program. So there, there are illustrations that focus on pathology, neuroanatomy, um, cell and molecular biology. So students get a, a, a real wide range of experience as well in the program. And when you take on your capstone project, you have a choice of several different areas of specialization that are really a reflection of the fo uh, focus of the research of faculty in our program. So health humanities, for example, graphic medicine, cell and molecular visualization, things like advanced web applications. Some uh, students like to work in patient education or health professional education. And then we also have a, a paleontologist on our faculty. So if you're interested in natural science, that's an option as well. So here's a, a quick example of a visual narrative that a student created, a graphic novel that looks at trauma therapy. And, and it's currently in use at, at Women's College in the program there, the trauma therapy program. And this student worked with one of our faculty to develop this. Um, here's another example in animation. In the brain, capillaries are surrounded by the blood-brain barrier, uh, which this plays a crucial... Animation looked at... Um, a new technology that is a delivery of medicine through these bubbles that are able to cross the blood brain barrier. So this student would have worked with a researcher at U of T whose research was in this area. So what is the admissions process like for our program? Well, uh, like all other programs, we require a four year degree with a minimum 3.0 GPA and required courses in English humanities like many other programs as well. We have some science prerequisites, cell and molecular biology, histology, um, and or um, intro physiology. Un unusually, we also uh, have the requirement of a portfolio of art. So if you've been doing sketches from high school through your undergrad or taking some art courses, we like to see that work. As well, of course, we like to see um, strong references in a letter of intent. And, and um, just to echo what Rory said, it's really imperative that you start early on that and you get very good references from academic supervisors that you've either studied under or worked with. 
You can look at our website, bmc.med.utoronto.ca to find full details of the program. Uh, every question you could possibly have should be answered there. Um, and here are just a few examples that I wanted to show you quickly of some of the portfolio submissions we received. So we like to see process and how illustrations were created. So here's an il illustration that conveys elasticity or tension. Um, uh, we also like to see things like objects cut into sections. So here's an example of an orange cut into sections. And that is something you would typically undertake in our program if you were doing, for example, surgical illustration. Um, so what can you do with a, a degree in biomedical communications? Well, uh, we're really lucky insofar as we have the largest concentration of biomedical visualization practitioners in uh, all of North America. And a lot of that has to do with our program our graduates have seeded local industry and there are many, many companies locally that students go to work for. Some go to work strictly in illustration, some in game design, some go um, into AR and VR and more emerging technologies. Uh, some find careers in information design and data visualization. Some work for animation studios doing work for big pharma. So there are so many different opportunities out there. Some. Um, continue in education, completing doctor, doctorates in either education or in medical sciences. So lots of different opportunities out there. Uh, it's, it's a very exciting field to be in right now. So on average, we um, receive around 100 applicants. We admit 18 students. Our, our average GPA for successful applicants this past year was 3.9. And our tuition this year for domestic students was 11,900 and international around 40, which is quite high and we're still looking to lower that. So to apply to the program, you can go through SGS and we're accepting applications until December 17th for admission next fall. Uh, if you have any other questions, of course, you can contact me directly, j.jenkinson at utrono.ca. You can also uh, check out our uh, social networks on Instagram or Twitter. And our website, of course, is a good source of information. I'm going to stop sharing there now. Thank you so much, Jody. Um, so next would be Dr. Avram Gottlieb and Brandon Wells uh, from Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology. Thank you. Brandon, can you share? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, could you go to the beginning? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Natasha, again, thank you very much for setting this up for us and giving us an opportunity to uh, interact with interested students. So as you uh, heard a little bit, uh, our program is a relatively new one. Uh, we're now, uh, we have our second cohort uh, of students. And again, it's a two-year uh, master's uh, program entitled Masters of Health Sciences in Laboratory uh, Medicine. And it's put on by the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology with assistance from the Departments of Gynecology and Obstetrics. And I'm uh, Avram Gottlieb, I'm the uh, program director and uh, I am a cardiovascular pathologist, clinician scientist, and have had a lot of experience in um, regulating and organizing and delivering graduate programs. Next, please. So uh, again, most people really don't quite know what these um, two fields are and these two disciplines or professions are. So let's spend just a touch of time on this. Um, a pathologist assistant contributes to diagnostic services in anatomical pathology through application of knowledge of tissue and laboratory analysis of specimens. So what this means is that you are, uh, as a pathologist assistant, an intermediary. So you receive the specimens uh, which uh, appear in the anatomical pathology laboratory in the hospital, and you um, uh, review the specimens and decide 
how to um, uh, treat them so that you can deliver appropriate tissue to the pathologist who will make the ultimate diagnosis. So you have to have a really good understanding of tissue, of disease, uh, of how uh, to um, communicate with your uh, pathologists. And all of these skills are ones that you will develop over the two year period. The clinical embryologist, which is the second field of the program, um, work in, M in uh, infertility uh, clinics. And again, um, they're essential to the whole management and delivery of infertility, um, um, di infertility diagnosis and infertility uh, treatment and uh, ha have a very <clears throat> important role to play. They also interact with colleagues, of course, but also with a, a clinical embryologist and with the infertility uh, physicians in the departments of, um, of uh, OBGYN. Next, please. So our goal of our program <clears throat> is to train PAs and uh, clinical embryologists in two separate fields. And uh, these are true professionals. And our intent is not just to give you the uh, professional skill set, but also for you to understand the scientific and societal underpinnings for your respective fields. And of course, to be clinically competent and to be prepared for lifelong learning. Uh, as you heard from other uh, uh, programs, uh, we're dealing with um, disciplines which are changing rapidly over time. And so being a lifelong learner becomes a very important uh, asset for you, uh, being able to read the literature and to modify your diagnostic and clinical skills uh, over time. Next, please. So the main objectives, just to go through them, is to have our graduates understand the scientific basis and research that provide the foundation for these two professional practices of PA and CE, to have our graduates achieve the academic and applied skills required to work effectively in the discipline, to have graduates gain the ability to be a problem solver, to be a critical scholar, an innovator, a leader, and a moral and ethical practitioner. All these extremely important in delivering um, uh, state-of-the-art healthcare, which is what you'll be doing. We also uh, want to provide the graduates with the tools to be critical self-learners and to embrace changes in the field as they occur, as we move um, the whole uh, medical um, uh, uh, disciplines moving more to precision medicine and patient-centered healthcare. And we also, of course, uh, do provide a valuable student experience within the program. So you have two years of uh, an enjoyable uh, student experience while uh, learning uh, a very uh, important discipline. Next, please. Uh, just briefly to show you the courses. And the reason I show you uh, them is for you to get an idea of uh, what uh, good uh, background preparation is for entering our program. And it's really the biomedical sciences. Uh, but we do, uh, we'll teach you cell and molecular biology, biomedical research methods, clinical laboratory management, how to manage a clinical laboratory, Biomedical ethics, very important. Biostatistics, again, very important in being able to uh, read the literature and to uh, carry out your um, activities. And finally, uh, capstone uh, project, which you've heard about uh, before. So these are the core courses that both CE and PAs uh, get. Next, please. The CEs then branch off into their own uh, courses, and you can see 
uh, advanced reproductive physiology, human embryology, ART, art of uh, the um, uh, foundations of ART, reproductive genetics, applied methods, innovations, and then current topics uh, in the causes and treatments of infertility and uh, laboratory decision-making. So all this uh, gives you the foundations, both uh, um, scientifically and clinically for your practice uh, in an infertility uh, laboratory. And then something unique, which is uh, really uh, what appears to us to be the first in the world is we've created a simulation lab, which allows um, the students to learn uh, skill sets required for clinical embryology in uh, a protected environment uh, in a simulation uh, laboratory. And uh, that uh, is starting up this year and um, we've uh, uh, had a, a lot of um, resources put into creating these uh, labs and it's uh, very exciting. Students are very excited about this. And then we will uh, also take you to some uh, rotations within the lab and uh, an elective. Next, please. For the PAs, uh, again, a lot of pathology and pathophysiology anatomy. The first two courses, one teaching you the basic science of pathobiology and the second teaching you about disease and how diseases affect organs and how that's like the disease uh, appears uh, in the organs of the body. Uh, two courses which are essential for the practice of uh, the PA discipline. And then you go into the hospitals and you have uh, practicums which are uh, four days a week, uh, which uh, allow you to actually practice on specimens under very tight supervision. So you're working in these um, uh, pathology, hospital pathology labs with a pathologist and with a pathologist assistant. So you're uh, getting firsthand knowledge from the people who are actually uh, doing the work and who are overseeing uh, your training. And the training is on a one-to-one -one basis. So it's face-to-face -face training, one-to-one. -one, um, our, um, our students are uh, dispersed uh, over our teaching hospitals um, uh, at the medical school. You also do a forensic pathology at the coroner's office and a, 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 um, a autopsy pathology at the University Health Network. We also teach you a little bit about biobanking. And of course you get this advanced anatomy dissection. Um, so as you can see for the PAs, the two sets of courses, uh, core uh, PA courses, which uh, are uh, lecture-based and the other are highly uh, practical. Next, please. And then we also do have a special substitute course. So if you come into our program, and you've already had uh, a course uh, as an undergraduate, uh, which pre uh, prevents you from uh, taking one of our courses, then we can offer you a substitute, which is a reading and research course, which is designed, again, you would be spending time on a one-to-one -one basis with one of our faculty. Next, please. So why a Masters of Health Science in Laboratory Medicine? Well, Clearly our faculty are leaders in their field across Canada. Uh, again, you've heard all the wonderful things about the University of Toronto and its uh, medical faculty. And that applies to our own Department of Pathology, uh, LMP, and um, it applies to the uh, clinicians and the basic scientists who are going to be training you. There's extensive career mentorship because you're working face-to-face, uh, -face, one -on one-on-one with um, the faculty. And what I didn't mention is that uh, we have a very small program. We have five in the PA uh, per year and five in the CE. So you can imagine the ratio of uh, teachers to students is, is very high. 
And uh, there is uh, substantial networking within our program. Students uh, interact with each other. Uh, this year, we're back in person for most of our courses, but we also do have the opportunity to bring in guest lectures through our um, um, uh, video conferencing uh, from all over the world uh, to uh, actually uh, teach and train our uh, students. Next. So uh, for information, um, you can contact me um, um, at my email. Brandon Wells is the Graduate and Life Sciences Education Officer. He's a wealth of information and has been very helpful to our, um, uh, to our own students in the program, but also to students who are inquiring. We're well represented on our uh, website, of course, and you can uh, go to the website. The key thing, if you have an opportunity, and I encourage everybody to do it, is to try to um, um, do uh, some type of an observership once these are allowed after the COVID-19 uh, uh, um, decreases, uh, but also to contact uh, through Brandon, you can contact uh, CEs and PAs, both students in our program or ones who are already practicing to get uh, some <clears throat> further information and feel for uh, the particular disciplines. Uh, we'll be around for uh, questions later on. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Avram. So next would be Karosh Kayanazad from Applied Immunology. Okay, thank you very much, Natasha. Share my screen with you. All right, thank you everybody once again for uh, joining us today at our information session. Um, I'm here to talk about the Masters of Science in Applied Immunology graduate program. Uh, as you know, immunology is a bit of a hot topic lately in, in the news and in the world. So uh, if you're interested in the field and uh, something that is uh, very impactful to the lives of many around the world in terms of the immune system and vaccine designs and vaccine uh, function and, and, and immune function, um, we've got a program for you. So the Applied Immunology a master's program is a little bit uh, different in that it's it's a uh, it straddles the the fence between research based and course based programs. Um, we are a predominantly research based um, program, but you do that research in the umbrella of courses, um, and you don't produce a thesis at the end. So essentially, we're a non thesis master's program. Uh, instead of a thesis, you break up your um, results into three reports and presentations that are spaced out evenly throughout the year. Um, so you don't basically pent up all your data and spit it out at this giant thesis at the end. You basically break it up into three little components throughout the year. Um, and like I said, you get to work in a lab. So the, the predominantly, uh, uh, um, the predominant work that you do is going to be in a lab. You've got your own project. You're going to be generating data towards that project. Um, but what also makes us unique is that we've got a very diverse course selection that you can choose from. So if you're interested in business or statistics or bioinformatics or pharmacology, uh, in addition to your interest in immunology, you can combine the two of them where you've got your work in immunology happening at the bench, but you can also take courses um, in, 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 in fields that are of, of interest. And students uh, in our program have historically taken courses in, um, in, in, in biochemistry, physiology, consulting even, um, some business courses some students are taking now as well. So we're pretty pretty diverse in terms of our course selection. Um, what also makes us unique is that we're a fixed length master's program. So you're, you know when you start and you know when you're gonna finish the, uh, the graduate program. For students starting with standard entry, so uh, pretty much most students coming into the program, it's two years long. So you start in, in September of year X, you finish in August of year X plus two. But if you do have um, uh, some prerequisite courses uh, through our department in fourth year, uh, chiefly a senior thesis project and two of four or five courses that we offer, you can enter the program with advanced standing. And this shaves off uh, two thirds of your um, uh, length in the program. So you can be finished in about 1.3 years with the advanced standing stream. Now, in addition to all of the wonderful science that we do in our department and, and all the data that we generate, uh, we've got a pretty active uh, sort of social and, and departmental community outside of the lab. 
Uh, we have um, our Impress Magazine, which is, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, we have Impress Magazine, oops, which is a student run, edited, designed, 100% student initiative that comes out every three or four months with articles that are topical to, to that time. So if you have an interest in, uh, in writing or drawing or editing, uh, there's an outlet for you uh, with Impress that you can, you can hone those skills and, 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 and sort of engage in that hobby. Uh, we also have, geez, my, my cursor is a little, little antsy here. Uh, we also have Inspire, which is our outreach program where we um, take uh, our, our knowledge of immunology and take it out to um, students, uh, high school students throughout the GTA. Uh, this year, we're inviting students to come to the St. George campus and uh, showing them what uh, what immunology is all about and, and, and showing them what lab life is all about. So again, if you're interested in outreach and, and inspiring the next generation of scientists, uh, we've got programs uh, as well for you. Uh, as well, we've got the Beyond Sciences Initiative, which is an international uh, student run. So all these are all student run initiatives, by the way. So the Beyond Sciences Initiative is an international student run uh, uh, organization that annually puts together an international conference. So uh, BSI was doing Zoom conferences before Zoom conferences were cool. So for the last six years, uh, six years ago, they started this. And, uh, you know, colleagues and students and researchers from Africa, Australia, Europe, Asia, South America, Central America, various parts of North America get together and share their data virtually over a two-day conference. So if you're interested in participating in that, that's also an, a, a phenomenal initiative to, to take part in. Um, what do our students do with their degrees? Well, you can do a lot of things, pretty much anything you'd like, because the, the core training that we give you in the Applied Immunology program is how to think critically, how to analyze, how to present data, um, and how to um, uh, basically be an independent thinker and researcher. And as you can see, our students have ended up in very diverse areas. Uh, some are research technicians, some have become analysts, uh, several have gone on to medical school. One starter started her own company about five, five or six years ago. Um, many students lately are using our applied immunology program as a stepping stone to our PhD program. So that's also a route if you wanna continue on uh, your, your academic um, studies. We've had students end up in, in consulting and, and analysts at, at, at a bank. Uh, we've even had a, a journalist uh, come out of our program as well. So it's, it's a very wide selection of, of job opportunities that are available to you uh, outside of the program. So essentially, if you can think it, you can do it. In terms of some key information for you, um, we do have two deadlines for our standard entry and advanced standing program, each with an application fee deadline and a documents deadline. So by January 1st, of 2022, you must have paid your application fee. And then by January 15th, you must have submitted all of your application documents. We're pretty strict on these. So um, make sure to meet these deadlines if you wanna be considered for the admission cycle. For students uh, uh, who are eligible for advanced standing, uh, it starts in May of 2022, the next cycle. And the application fee deadline is February 15th, 2022 with the documents deadline of March uh, 1st, 2022. Um, I'll also add that the standard entry program only starts in the fall, so we don't have any other intake um, beyond the fall. If you have any questions, you could reach me at applied.immunology at utrona.ca, and you can find more details on the admission requirements, application uh, requirements and processes, and the course structure at our website at immunology.utrona.ca. Thank you very much. Don't forget Thank to click like, like and subscribe. <laughs> uh, the next will be Helen, Dr. Helen Meliotis from Medical Physiology. Hi everyone, can you see my screen okay? Yes. Okay, thank you. So I come uh, to you from the Department of Physiology where we are now uh, finishing up a year of celebrations from the discovery of insulin in our department, a hundred years of this gift to the world. Uh, and while we have a long uh, history, we of course don't wanna rest on that history. We wanna move forward and push the field forward and really train graduate students both in the realms of research, but also now with this uh, Master of Health Sciences program, how to take that research and really translate it to the real world. So if uh, you're interested and have some background in physiology and want to continue on into a career in physiology, for example, do you want to become an analyst who can interpret big data sets in health, but also understand their impact on patient care? or a scientist who understands innovative technologies and the commercialization process, how to bring these things to market? 
or a project manager with the skills to organize a diverse team, including research, business, and clinical points of view? If so, this is the program for you. Our program rationale is to take people that understand human physiology, have an understanding of research, both through some past experiences, as well as through their core elective courses in the program that are really research focused, and then train them with further uh, courses that I'll describe in a moment to really put this new research and knowledge into practice, into clinical settings, business settings, and really um, begin to delve into AI and that potential in health. We do this through some pillars in our program. Uh, we have a course in big data analysis in health where students are shown um, clinical, clinically relevant examples and um, get introduced to machine learning. We uh, talk about healthcare interventions through a clinical physiology course, for example. We have a commercialization course where students are taught by both physiology faculty as well as faculty members from the Rotman School of Management, the business school here at U of T, and are able to discuss IPs, create their own business plans and so forth, and throughout the program um, have opportunities to train in project management and other courses. So it's only a one year program structure. 12 months in length with one point of entry in September. We are the only program of its kind in Canada that has a one year program. And so in the fall and winter term, students take these core courses in professional development. They write a literature review where they're coupled one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member throughout the year. And this is a review article that will be of publishable quality. And in fact, a number of our reviews from students last year are in, in press at the moment. We have a big data and health course, as I mentioned, a clinical physiology course that is taught strictly by clinicians that come into the course and describe how recent advances in physiology and research and commercial applications are impacting their own patient care, the commercialization and collaboration course in physiology, and then students take some core elective physiology courses from our rich um, electives here in physiology, both in neurophysiology, cardiovascular physiology, endocrine, um, and reproduction and so forth. And so really students have the core courses and then can really tailor their uh, training into the program of interest. And the program culminates with a four month practicum placement in the summer term. Some of the sample placements, so we only had one year, this program has only run uh, for only one year. We started in the fall of 2020 last year. And despite the COVID uh, limitations, we were still able to secure more placements and students for our uh, program. And a lot of our students also went ahead and found their own. And really the courses we see through the practical placements are really fulfilling our, our objectives for the program. We had students working in artificial, uh, using artificial intelligence tools to work at fertility clinics, looking at which embryos would be um, best implanted, um, working at TGH, looking at with the lung transplant team to use AI to create models as to which lungs could be best um, used for transplants. A number of our students worked at CAMH in neuroinformatics. We had students working with a wearable textiles company. We had students working uh, with clinicians that wanted to commercialize a lot of uh, new diagnostic tools and so on. Um, students looking at market research support as well with the business development team um, at Sick Kids and so forth. So really this idea of combining big, some students wanted to go into big data, some students wanted to go into commercial areas, and so forth, the, we gave them the tools to be able to get these positions. So this is a snapshot of some of our placement organizations last summer, again, both um, hospital and research settings, as well as companies shown here. And more than half of uh, respondents to our exit survey were offered a paid position after their practicum placement. Keep in mind that a few of our students uh, were really clear also from the beginning that they all wanted to pursue further studies. Some of them are in medical school now, dental school, as well as PhDs as well. From our exit survey as well, um, when we asked how would you rate the educational learning progress you made during the MHSC program, 100% of respondents said very good to excellent. And if I were to start my graduate career again, I would select the same program or MHSC in medical physiology and 100% of respondents said they would agree or strongly agree. So we are really looking for 
people that have a minimum of an introductory physiology course. We are a physiology program at its core. And the reason we can keep the program to one year is because our applicants come in with a strong foundation in physiology to begin with. It doesn't mean you have to have done a physiology major, but at least a minimum of one thorough introductory course that covers all the, the body systems. And our first round of applications is January 14th for the application fee with all references and documents by the end of January. And after that, we offer rolling admissions. We will have a second round of applications in April, but I encourage you to really apply in the first round as again, we offer rolling admissions after January. You can email us at the email address shown here. You can sign up for email updates as well. And I'll put in the chat our website. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Uh, so next up would be Dr. Cindy Woodland from Applied Clinical Pharmacology. There, you can hear me now and see my slides. Yep. So welcome everyone. ACP is a two-year course-based master's offered by the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Although if you do have a significant background in undergraduate pharmacology, you can request consideration for our one-year advanced standing option. And what students tell us that they like about the ACP program is the ability to really tailor your learning to your own individual career goals. So you are required to take three full and four half courses. And that brings us to a total of five of the required eight uh, full course equivalents in our program. Uh, and following that, you actually complete an independent clinical research project for a minimum of four months. And that's under the supervision of a graduate faculty member of your choice, again, depending on your own research interests. So, we keep our class relatively small because we like to have a very interactive curriculum, a lot of discussions. And uh, we also like to work with you on developing your own skills and choosing that research project that matches your interests, as well as uh, participating in a practicum opportunity, which can be over four months, eight months, or sometimes the entire year. So almost, um, and almost all of our students do take the practicum opportunity. Um, so to prepare you for your independent research project and your practicum, we offer a curriculum that provides both depth and breadth of learning and really spans everything from your understanding of how drugs exert their effects, sometimes therapeutic, uh, hopefully therapeutic, but sometimes also um, undesired effects, as well as why we experience inter and intra individual variation in drug response. And we also explore the entire drug development pathway from drug discovery through clinical trials, regulatory approval procedures, and even post marketing drug safety. And we integrate professional development throughout our program. So we spend a lot of time working with you on career awareness and career preparedness. And we have an entire course that's focused on helping you get ready to apply for the independent research project in the practicum, um, but really to explore your long-term goals. And we find that many students, particularly at this stage of your career, you might not know exactly what you wanna do and you don't always know all of the opportunities out there because there are so many, particularly in this particular area. So we spend time bringing in people from different career paths to tell you a little bit about their day-to-day -day experiences and what they do and uh, what they've learned along the way. And we'll introduce you to a variety of career paths, some of which you may never have heard of or considered. And we are also working on developing your skills throughout the program. So obviously enhancing your critical thinking, your data uh, analysis skills, um, but there'll be a lot of problem solving. So our courses uh, involve independent work as well as team-based work and solving real life problems that you would encounter in the world of pharmacology and drug development. We obviously um, spend a lot of time talking about effective scientific communication. In fact, some of our graduates actually choose to go on into medical writing or medical editing or scientific communications. 
And I've mentioned teamwork a couple of times because we actually have something called the ACP teams where we divide you into groups of four and you rotate throughout our program in different groups. So you get an opportunity to work with every member of the program by the time you graduate. And those teams work independently to develop um, professionally and personally. And sometimes they're doing everything from reviewing resumes to discussing career opportunities to going out to escape rooms and to um, playing board games together and to really um, building a professional network and uh, having fun in graduate school because we think it's really important that you get to know people and that you have a supportive environment and we're very proud of our program for the uh, support that our members do provide to each other and that really facilitates networking as uh, you're going through the program but also after graduation. So I want to just pause to say graduate school is, is a lot of work and we have a very rigorous program, but we also really believe in spending time thinking about, you know, what you want to do in the future and thinking about how you're enjoying uh, going through your graduate studies. So the graduate student experience is very important to us and we do have a lot of extracurricular activities. We feel our program helps you expand your social and professional networks. And we're really aiming to develop your transferable skills. And that's what our employers are looking for is how well you adapt to new environments. So we provide a number of career opportunities through our placement uh, program. And with this program, you get to choose which area you'd like to work in. Um, so for example, some of our students work in big pharma, some like to work with contract research organizations or small, smaller pharmaceutical companies. Some students want to work with the government, either at the federal level, the provincial level, or the municipal level. Some of our students pursue consulting firms, um, particularly in pharmaceutical consulting, um, but some in management consulting. And uh, we also have students who are, and more and more so, interested in uh, scientific and medical communications. So I couldn't fit all of our placement partners on the slide. We're welcoming our ninth cohort this year. And we've had a number of graduates um, go off uh, through their practica to continue working with their employers. So most of our employers will hire students uh, after their practicum. So they stay on, you graduate with a full-time job. And again, there are a variety of different opportunities and we work with you individually to see what you're looking for in your experience. Often it's to get a taste of what's out there and what a role might be. A lot of students are interested in clinical research, whether it's from the hospital-based clinical trial side or from the industry side. Uh, some are looking at coordinating clinical trials and the, the management of clinical trials. Some people are interested in the regulatory aspects, so being a regulatory affairs associate, for example. Some people are interested in data management and the data uh, management piece around clinical trials is an example. So there's a wide variety of opportunities and consulting is another area where people with an interest in kind of a more breadth of uh, understanding of that clinical research process and uh, the marketing and, and sales of products uh, are also interested there. So our placement, again, it's an opportunity to either do four months of full-time work, you are paid at industry standard for that, for that um, employment, and uh, eight months is an, another popular opportunity. And in fact, our employers generally want students to come for a minimum of eight months. And if you're interested in our program, the way that you apply, we're looking at applications from students who are either in their last year of undergraduate study or have already graduated. Uh, we do get a number of physicians and pharmacists who are coming back to learn a little bit more about clinical research. Um, and so our class is, is a single class um, for all of our applicants, and we really um, try to integrate everyone with, with their different backgrounds. You do not have to have a background in pharmacology to join our program. However, we do recommend that you have strong physiology and biochemistry background um, to facilitate your learning. And uh, we will work with you on the pharmacology. And obviously, there's an advanced standing opportunity for students who do have that pharmacology background already. So we have um, rolling admissions, uh, rolling interviews. Uh, but we recognize that if you're in your last year of study, you may be waiting on some final grades. Uh, so do remember to 
submit your final transcript in addition to what you may have submitted, submitted earlier if you're applying. We do require three letters of recommendation and um, we prefer academic letters, but we do take into consideration if you've had work experience, for example, or uh, something that you feel is, is relevant to your application. And we spend a lot of time reading your personal statements. So we read every personal statement. And this is an opportunity for you to tell us why you want to be in the program, give us a little bit of background information. If you failed a course in second year, you can explain why in that, in that uh, application. So it's really your opportunity to communicate with us uh, and let us know why you think you'd be a great candidate for ACP. Our deadlines are January 14th if you're an international student and April 15th, again 2022, if you are a domestic student. However, as I've mentioned, we will begin considering applications as soon as we receive them. So we do have interviews from January onwards and we finalize our class by the spring. If you require any further information, you're welcome to look at our website or to email us at acp.farm at utoronto.ca. And I'm happy to stick around and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Cindy. Uh, next would be Alim Lalani for Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy. Thank you, Natasha. So I will go ahead and share my screen. All right. Hope everyone can see that presentation okay. Uh, so welcome. I am from the Department of Occupational Science and Occupational Therapy, and our program is the Master of Science in Occupational Therapy, MSCOT. So this is the program you would take if you wanted to become an occupational therapist uh, in, in Canada. So um, it's two years. Uh, you're looking at uh, six terms in total, including your summers. You start off with a foundational year, and then we give you some applied skills. Throughout the program, there's field work. So that's effectively putting you into a clinical or administrative environment where you're going to be working uh, with an occupational therapist. Um, it's kind of like an internship in a way. And uh, throughout the program, there is mentorship, there is research, there is uh, EDI, which stands for Equity, Diversity and Inclusion Education. And all that matters because U of T is in a uh, unique place in the world. We're in a very diverse city, and we want to make sure that our graduates are equipped to uh, work with uh, different types of modalities, different types of people, and um, experience different types of uh, situations. So nothing is going to be a shock to you when you enter your career. So where do occupational therapists work? Um, on the screen there, you can see they are everywhere. You may not even know that they're there, um, except for the letters beside their name that say OT registration. And so a big area of growth these days for OTs has been in mental health. So a lot of OTs uh, perform psychosocial services. So that includes even things like mental health counseling, addictions counseling, um, substance abuse uh, counseling. And OTs are also big into technology these days. So we've seen OTs hired by software and hardware development companies to work on assistive devices. So that could be everything from uh, say a wheelchair that has sensors on the side so that it doesn't hit the side of a doorway, um, or even working on robotics, um, things like uh, that work with algorithms for how you take steps up and down the stairs. So OTs are everywhere. You'll see articles in the news occasionally where they, they talk about OTs. It's not a hugely well-known profession relative to other healthcare professions, uh, but it is out there. And um, the idea is that OTs want to be in areas where there are other healthcare professionals as well, because they all work as a team. So why U of T? Of course, we have incredible core faculty and clinical faculty. Um, our faculty are known internationally. So you'll see us uh, performing um, at um, conferences abroad. Um, our teaching methods are uh, dynamic. Uh, we use everything from distance-based learning, case-based learning, um, in-person seminars, interprofessional education, and of course, our placement sites are all around the greater Toronto area. We have a UTM, U of T Mississauga uh, campus cohort as well. So every year we register uh, 90 students at St. George and approximately 40 students at UTM. Um, so if you prefer the smaller campus environment, maybe UTM is, the, is what you would prefer. Um, and in your application to our program, you can specify your uh, campus preference, whether that's uh, St. George or Mississauga, or you have no preference. 
Because this is a master's program, we do have an emphasis on research as well. So despite the fact that it's a professional master's program and you're graduating with a job ready degree, you are still going to conduct research. And that is a course called the Graduate Research Project. It's during the second year of the program. And you're going to take that for um, three to four terms in a row. And you'll be set up with a supervisor on a specific project. You'll do an actual um, full length paper presentation. And um, hopefully, if you want to go on to a PhD program after, you can transition that into a longer term uh, project that becomes your PhD thesis eventually. So just some examples of our research. And I mentioned before, you know, the technology piece, which sort of touches on number four and number five there. Um, but of course, we have traditional areas of research and practice, uh, particularly number six, seven and eight. Um, looking at family caregivers, you know, in, in this world that we're in, this COVID world, long-term care is, is a big policy matter these days. Um, preparing uh, youth with disabilities for transition. So it's not just moving them through the system into school and into work. It's everyday living. How can we enable um, people to take care of themselves or have the tools to reach out to those who may be able to assist them? The field work during this program, it's a thousand hours of clinical field work. Um, you're not necessarily placed in a clinical environment per se. You can be placed in an administrative environment as well where you're doing policy work. But the idea is that you are going to get skills and abilities that allow you to enter practice by the end of the program. But again, it's not a big shock when you enter the workforce. Our field work placement sites uh, go as far west as Mississauga and as far east as Whitby. Uh, that said, we've seen students go as far east as even Oshawa uh, and even west. Sometimes they go into Burlington or uh, as you see there, north into Brampton. Um, the sites are everywhere. They really are, uh, which is great. And um, you know, if you, if you don't have access uh, to a vehicle, of course, we'll have placements that are public transit accessible. So it's not an extra cost to you. Of course, student life is important in the program. We have an active OSNOT student association. Um, and they do everything from rehab-related activities, uh, from professional development, all the way up to your typical student activities like athletics or acoustics or, or arts. Um, there's so many things for everyone here. From the financial perspective, the tuition and incidental fees are approximately $13,000 per year, and it's a two-year program. And if you're planning on living in Toronto or Mississauga, you should also budget at least $1,000 to $1,500 a month for your living expenses. Um, there are some costs associated with placements, uh, such as traveling to your placement on transit, but they're not huge. They really are not, uh, even though the placements are not paid. And we do have bursaries in our program. Thanks to the Graduate Life Science Education Office, we have something called the Professional Master's Financial Aid Program. That is a needs-based bursary program, and the average amount students who apply for it receive is over $2,000. And I would say probably 60 to 80 uh, percent in some years who, of students who apply for this bursary do receive a bursary. Now, the part you're probably be waiting for, admission requirements. It is a competitive entry program. Um, last year, we had our highest number of applications ever. We got a, a, over 1,000 applications for 130 spaces. So, is it impossible to get in? The answer is no, it is not impossible to get in. Um, typically our average entering GPA, we call it the sub GPA because it's based on the last two years of your degree or your last 20 half credits. That's gonna be in the A minus or higher range, so ideally 3.75 to 4.0. There are no prerequisites required, but if you wanna do a little less studying when you get into our program, uh, taking a look at courses in undergrad in statistics, research, uh, biology, physiology, psychology, and not listed there, uh, probably also sociology, anthropology, and psychology. Um, those are all fantastic areas to take undergrad. As part of our non-academic assessment, there's a personal statement submission. It's going to ask you questions about why you want to study OT, why you want to become an OT, and your understanding of the OT's role in society and in practice. It's going to ask for a resume. And interesting to note, we know that COVID has limited your access to both paid and volunteer experience. That's perfectly fine. Uh, we're going to be looking more closely at things like your coursework, your extracurricular activities, including virtual activities. And most importantly, we review uh, and, and uh, see paid 
uh, needs-based experience the same as volunteer experience. So for example, if you had to work at a restaurant, pay for your education undergrad, and you didn't have time to volunteer for free at some organization for which you had no personal connections to, that's perfectly fine. We see that as equivalent, and that is part of our equity, diversity, and inclusion initiatives. We want to make sure that you are not disadvantaged because you did not have personal connections to go and volunteer at a place where you might have a family member who works. So um, keep on working. Um, you're that, you, you'll, the challenge for you, uh, if you don't have that volunteer experience, will simply be to articulate how the experience from your paid work, your paid unrelated work, can transfer into a career as an OT. So for example, if you work at a restaurant, you might be dealing uh, with some very uh, aggressive patrons and uh, you might have developed problem solving skills based on that. You might have worked with your employer on assisting those who have disabilities in that, in that workplace, either as customers or as people with you. So it's gonna be articulating how those transferable skills uh, work towards an application uh, to an OT program. Lastly, uh, references. So one is gonna be an academic reference, ideally someone who's taught you a course. And the second reference can be from a professional source, maybe someone who you've worked for or done volunteer work for, or someone who knows you from the community. On your application, um, you're all going to be considered for both campuses, Mississauga and the St. George campus, but we are going to send out a survey after you apply by email. And that survey is simply going to ask you, do you prefer the Mississauga campus, St. George campus, or you have no preference? It has no effect on your admissibility. It's just a preference question. Simple as that. So offers of admission typically go out in May. Uh, the application itself is due uh, in early January, but so there's like this four or five month period where you're waiting. You know, you can get a bit anxious around that, but uh, honestly, it's for the best. We're trying to get the best and the brightest. And we do look at each application individually and very closely. So when you're admitted to our program, it is at that time that your campus assignment will be communicated to you as either Mississauga or the St. George campus. So what's a typical successful applicant? Ideally, you have that four-year degree from a science or liberal arts program. Um, you've got some exposure to the profession of OT, so either that's through your own research, reading, advocacy, um, working with those who have special needs, volunteer experience, work experience. A variety of things are eligible to be considered exposure to, to the profession of OT. Um, you would have a, a GPA of 3.7, so again, an A minus or an A or higher. You would probably be in the top 10% of your class and your references uh, would be strong and positive, both. So how do you apply? My understanding is that the application is gonna become available tomorrow, uh, October 14th, and that's gonna be on the Ontario Rehabilitation Sciences Programs Application Service website. A lot of words, O-R-P-A-S, we call it ORPAS. So you're gonna apply there. It's not through the School of Graduate Studies application. This is a separate application website, okay? Everything goes to this ORPAS organization. They're a clearinghouse for all the documents and they will calculate your grades for you. So the application deadline is probably going to be in early January. That's going to be uh, released tomorrow when the application launches. There's our contact information. There is a human behind that address. So you can write to us and we will write back with an articulate and a well thought out response. So do not feel shy. Ideally, we'd like you to check our website first for the information. We do have a frequently asked questions page, but again, we do welcome your questions as well. Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Lim. Um, so I will start a recording from Sarah McMahon uh, from Physical Therapy, and I'm going to share my screen. I think you need to share your computer sound. There's still no sound, Natasha.
needs to be kind of slow. Okay, we'll skip um, physical therapy and I'll send everyone the recording. And for next would be Adrian Dragomir um, from Speech Language Pathology. Everybody, thank you. Natasha, I will share my screen now just one second. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Yes. And you can hear me properly. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, thank you, Tasha. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Adriana Dragomir. I'm the Student Affairs Administrator for the Department of Speech Language Pathology um, for the professional master's program in speech language pathology. Um, so I'd like to welcome you to this wonderful presentation today. To thank Natasha, first of all, for organizing this um, every year. It's, so, it's such a great opportunity for students to hear about the wonderful master's program that the Faculty of Medicine at EFT has to offer. Now, a little bit about our program. Um, this is not a new program. It was established in 1958. A master's degree was established in 1980. And then the research programs, the Master of Science and the PhD program was, uh, they were established in 1995. So there are three programs in total and it's easy to get confused a little bit, but uh, here's what it, this looks like. The Master of Health Science is the one I'm, uh, I'm here to, to describe to you today. And this is the professional program. Um, and under the Rehabilitation Sciences Institute live the Master of Science and the Doctor of Philosophy programs, which are the research programs. Um, if you've, I don't know if you've ever had a speech defect or somebody in your family has had a speech defect, maybe a swallowing um, difficulty, um, but in case you have not crossed paths with, a, with an SLP, um, here's what they do. Um, they have expertise in development in disorders of communication and swallowing. Um, so, and they work, so they, they wear many hats. They work as clinicians, so they help you actually speak better. Um, they help people who've had strokes, for example, um, swallow again. Um, so they work in a variety of teams. Um, collaborating with, with um, other clinicians and researchers to um, help rehabilitate um, um, individuals with, with a variety of health issues. They also teach, they manage their own clinics, um, and they carry out excellent research. Um, and they, they're everywhere um, in, in Canada, in urban centers, as well as in rural areas. So these are some of the places where you can find SLPs, working in hospitals, um, in schools, rehabilitation centers. Uh, many have their own private practices um, or they teach um, and or carry research. Um, our program is 22 months long um, and it goes on without interruption. So you have to make sure when you apply that you know what you've committed to. Uh, you don't get to take an, a break, maybe small breaks here and there, but uh, it, it runs right through the 22 months. Um, it's, it com it's comprised of five academic units. Each of the academic unit is followed by a clinical unit where you get to approximate what you've learned in the academic unit. At the end, you have get to create a capstone portfolio where you must demonstrate competence in a number of uh, departmental um, curriculum objectives. So you have to understand that you've reflected um, on your experiences and you've integrated what you've learned from um, being in a program. Um, some of the innovative um, features of a program are integrated learning experiences, 
I've already mentioned the integrated academic and clinical modules. There are teaching clinics during clinical placement, so that's great. We have other um, um, experts in the field teaching, um, teaching gear and sharing their, their experience. So you get exposed to a variety of, of work. Um, evidence informed practice focus, I've mentioned the CAPS and portfolio, and also um, the interprofessional education curriculum, which is great. It actually, it's when, when you um, become familiar with um, some of the other professions that you will be working with in providing care. Um, our faculty is worldwide recognized. They carry out excellent research and they're very, very connected to the SLP community in both education and, and research. We also have a very supportive alumni association. Um, they're, they're highly involved and they will, they, they work as great mentors and they're involved in some of the events that we have in the, in the award ceremony. So it's great, it's a, it's a, it's a growing community and it's, it's very tight knit even as it continues to grow. I've already mentioned that it's a, a 22 month long program. We only have one intake in September. The uh, next application deadline is January 7th, 2022 for a September 22 um, admission. You must apply on our pass. Uh, the admission windows will open, I believe next week. We admit 60 students per year. So this is what you need to apply. You need to have the equivalent of a four-year undergraduate degree um, and a minimum B, B standing in final year. Now this is an, a school of graduate studies requirement. This um, is for all applicants to graduate school. And, year two. Um, and here come our own pre, um, um, admission requirements. Uh, we ask for a number of prerequisite courses. Um, they must be in the areas of child development, phonetics, general linguistics, statistics, and research methods. So you must have half courses in these areas, and you also have uh, to have a full course in human physiology. And you must have a B plus in each of these courses. In addition, we ask for two reference letters, um, academic and one clinical, um, for a letter of intent. Uh, which is where you state um, as clearly as you can what draws you to the profession, what are some of the experiences that you've had that have led you to this path, to this career path. And we normally ask for a clinical, for clinical volunteer experience of at least minimum hours. Um, now, in light of COVID, uh, last year and this year, we're also we're, we're waiving the clinical uh, requirement, both the clinical letter and the volunteer experience. Um, this, as you know, is not a funded program, so there are costs associated with it. Uh, we do have, um, however, a healthy bursary program and also awards that you can apply for to support yourself uh, throughout the program. Um, also, uh, we, um, we offer a few Ontario graduate scholars, scholarships every year, and we encourage all applicants to apply. So when you open your admission application on our pass um, and you start asking for reference letters from your professors, consider applying for an OGS as well and ask for reference letters to be sent to U of T for that purpose. Now, the deadline for applying to, uh, for an OGS is mid-March. And this is uh, where my presentation ends. Um, our departmental website, srpw.utrenter.ca. Um, if you write to me directly to this email address, I will respond to you the same day, pretty much. Um, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, good luck with your applications and uh, we look forward to you know, receiving your questions and your applications. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Adriana. So next is Joseph, Dr. Joseph Ehrenbach uh, for a translational research program. Excellent, thank you. Um, I am hoping that you will now be able to see my screen. Uh, can anyone see it? It's black, same thing that happened to Rachel. Oh, most excellent. <laughs> 
uh, okay, um, that is a shame, but it's okay because actually I was not planning to talk about the slides per se. Um, I was going to talk to everyone about why are we here today? Why do you want to do a graduate degree? What is the point? We have at the U of T some absolutely excellent and amazing educators. And um, you've heard from a number of really amazing programs. And the TRP, the Translational Research Program, we also are pretty amazing. We are a program that is intended though for people who are looking for something a little bit different. So to really find out more in depth what we're about, I really encourage you to go to our website, trp.utoronto.ca and look into our info session. The next one is happening November 10th at 4 p.m. Uh, register and that is where you will be able to ask questions meet with our students and alumni and really find out what our program is about, much more so than in five minutes. But I will tell you this, what we are interested in and who we are looking for are people that want to train their brain. You see, when you learn something new, that changes something in your brain. Making mistakes and learning from them builds new pathways and new ideas and new connections. At the TRP, we believe that that is one of the key things that we should be helping you learn, not to memorize things, but to actually apply knowledge across different kinds of contexts. You see, our mission is to challenge our students, you who are out there, um, to actually think differently, to be able to look at new challenges and to lead and initiate change that improves health and healthcare and medicine. We do not, we have a curriculum, but we are not focused on a particular domain other than helping you to learn and become and grow into a better professional and a better individual who is capable of solving problems, of tackling new issues. Because you see, health innovation, uh, that landscape, being able to translate research, to translate um, into something interesting, you need to have the skill set, the ideas, the um, ability to improvise, to think, to problem solve. And that is why the TRP is here to challenge you to think differently. Our students, I'm told that they can see my screen now, are generally from very different backgrounds. We have recent graduates that work with people that are about to retire. We have clinicians, MD, PhDs. Uh, we have people from the arts. We have business people. And we have uh, people from science. They come from all different life stages. But what unifies them is that they are all curious that they want to take initiative and want to learn. They want to tackle complex medical health problems collaboratively, and they want to have impact. So what we do is we provide you with support so that you can think differently, learn differently, and have impact. Um, we help you to expand your perspectives, to develop a growth mindset by learning by doing, and to cultivate competencies like problem solving, working in teams, uh, critically analyzing things. Um, we help you learn differently by putting you in a self-directed experiential environment 
where there are problems to solve, people to work with, real world issues that you go out and you, whether it's online or mediated or in the OR, you tackle real innovation problems and you learn with peers and people become your peers that are very different from all walks of life. That is what we mean. What this means for students is that our students are different. They are the students who start up anti-racism committees, podcasts, lecture series, networking events. They are, they help with product development and startups. They help initiate projects across multiple fields and they have real impact. So here is one capstone project, Refactory Incontinence. This particular group of individuals managed to provide children with an alternative to invasive surgery by looking at needs and figuring out how they can clinically try um, a minimally invasive neuromodulation uh, uh, technology that wasn't yet in Canada. This other group involved engineer, uh, uh, someone who from industry who does 3D printing uh, and a clinician, and they built a new kind of model for teaching surgeons how to deal with invasive placentation. We've had people build websites to improve access to mental health. We've had people uh, look at different ways of um, uh, taking out uh, kidney cysts the range of kind of opportunities are only limited by your passions and your interests. We are the people that help facilitate the learning at a graduate level where you're not memorizing, but you are engaging and you're learning and you're applying your knowledge in different contexts. So our career paths, like everyone else, uh, can be quite diverse. We've had people go to industry, research, government, uh, do, uh, have startups, uh, work in academe, um, and do things that we never imagined, uh, actually. So develop their own careers. We have somebody doing innovation advisement as a senior analyst for the Dutch government. Um, it was just our students make their own opportunities. So our applications open October 22nd check out our uh, info session. And I'm here as well as Jana and Emma to answer any questions that you might have. But really my biggest advice to you, regardless of the program, choose where you feel comfortable, something that speaks to you and where you can learn to explore your passions. Because if you're passionate about whatever it is you end up doing, you will do it better, longer, and you will be more successful than if you just go through the motions. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Um, thank you, everyone, for their patience. We have one more left. Uh, the next would be uh, Stacy Houston from Genetic Counseling. Hi there. Oh, I got the wrong background. Excuse my background. Um, I'm uh, Stacey Houston. I'm the director of the Gen Counseling Program at U of T. Um, we've been around well-established um, program at U of T for over 20 years. Um, and for those of you who don't know, genetic counselors have specialized training in medical genetics and in counseling to help individuals integrate genomic health information and make decisions um, about their health. So this may include interpreting genetic testing results, providing guidance and support to patients and families who are interested in how inherited diseases and conditions might affect them or their family members, which genetic tests may be avail um, most appropriate for them, and also facilitating important decision-making about um, genetic testing and genetic uh, results. So this is from our most recent professional status survey. Certainly genetic counseling is a growing profession with many different job opportunities. Um, some counselors work in direct patient care where a proportion of counselors do either a mix of inpatient or direct patient care and sort of 
um, non-direct patient care. So many um, counselors may work in laboratories, um, potentially within nonprofits or within government agencies, public health, um, within university centers or hospital centers, and a variety of specialty areas. The biggest um, in North America being in cancer genetics, where many um, genetic testing opportunities exist to help um, guide patients' um, uh, treatment as well as their um, screening. Our program is a full de full-time degree program, prepares students both with the academic knowledge and clinical skills so that upon graduating, they can work as highly competent counselors in a variety, a variety of practice settings. So our courses are developed and taught by genetic counselors and tailored to support the development of the foundational knowledge that's required for clinical competencies. So first year courses lay the foundation for these competencies. Um, if within first year, we get students um, clinical exposure right, right away, mostly to common genetic conditions and in observational clinics, as you see listed. Um, we have during COVID sort of modified this a little bit, um, but certainly in ensured that students had um, uh, exposure to the patient experience through this, through our new model. Our... Um, uh, we have many hospitals in the downtown core that are, are participating in our uh, program, as well as um, sort of just in the GTA. Um, so a variety of clinical sites that allow our students um, to access them, many by foot or by transit, as you can see. And in second semester, students um, dive into more hands-on rotations where they get to slowly develop their counseling skills and exposure to different um, clinical situations. Year two, the courses build on the first year with the uh, various um, guest speakers from leaders in the U of T community, including discussions of ethical and professional issues that are important in our clinical practice. Um, and this is a non-thesis master's program and students then develop and complete an independent research project um, of their choice. Second year, the rotations um, involve increasing clinical responsibility to develop counseling competencies under supervision. And students also have the opportunity for a four-week elective in a variety of fields that include both clinical and non-clinical options. Um, other, other opportunities is we do encourage a summer placement at a site outside of our program, and this um, uh, provides different learning opportunities as well as networking options um, and a variety of um, supplementary activities that, that occur both in the U of T and hospital um, environment. Our program does not require a, a GRE. We do have um, some scholarship, scholarships and bursary opportunities. Um, it certainly provides a unique experience um, with exposure to diverse patient populations. And again, our graduates um, are hired into a variety of different um, positions, including within the clinics, lab, health policy, and research. We have an upcoming um, Giant Counseling Virtual Information Day on November 26th, which you can get information from our website. And this is our main contact for our educational um, coordinator. Thanks so much. Uh, thank you, Stacy. Uh, unfortunately, I have to cut the question period short as my colleague needs the webinar um, right after this. So if um, all the emails are, are uh, part of each presenter's uh, presentation. So you can definitely uh, check the recording after I've sent it out. Uh, thank you so much to the presenters and the uh, attendees. Um, and I will stop recording.